this whole idea that you're going to end up with like unlimitedly cheap electricity um, with no consequences. Uh, like that's a really kind of bad narrative to, to, to be going with. We want clean electricity and get to, towards that, but there is always a cost for that in all sorts of ways. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a lecturer, a climate corruption reporter, and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists, and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, and political crises that we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week, I spoke with Dave Jones. Dave is the head of data insights at Ember, an independent energy think tank that is trying to help shift the world from coal to clean electricity. Dave, join me to discuss clean electricity, uh, walking us through why a transition is critical and why a rapid transition is critical. We talk about the problems with coal, gas and biomass and discuss the benefits of wind and solar. We then go into a little conversation about degrowth and energy demands and energy needs, with me insisting that we cannot talk about a sustainable future and renewable energy without also contracting our energy demands and our economies. Interestingly enough, uh, after we stopped recording, Dave said to me, the first thing Dave said to me, was, oh, I thought you were going to hit me harder on the degrowth thing, having listened to your back catalogue. And he wants us all to know that Ember absolutely supports uh, degrowth and the need. However, what Dave said is that they have identified where they can be effective, i.e. talking about the clean transition, helping governments understand, lobbying politicians to understand the necessity of it. And that is the button that they keep pushing. That is the messaging that they have figured out, the data that they figured out, and that is where they are effective. So Ember sees themselves as within a network of people and organizations that are trying to build a sustainable future. And whilst they might not be going to politicians and talking about degrowth, they understand that other people are and that that is also a crucial part of the conversation. So I just thought that worth putting out there uh, because anybody who listens to Planet Critical obviously knows that uh, the stance of the show is that there is no sustainable future without a contracted economy. But I thought it worth flagging here just in case anybody thinks like Dave that don't push hard enough in the episode. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you're loving the show, support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. The link is in the description box below. By signing up, you'll also get access to the weekly article I write inspired by each interview. Thank you to everyone who has signed up and is supporting the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who keep the project going every week. Dave, thank you very much for joining me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for the invitation. Could you please uh, tell us all about what you do and Ember? Yeah, yeah. We um, coming up to our third anniversary of, uh, of Ember, and we we kind of relaunched uh, the work that we've been doing within Sandbag, which was looking at uh, pacing out coal generation across Europe um, to try to take right. that to a, a bit more of a global platform. So it started off by tracking the coal to clean electricity transition. Now it's just, um, focused mostly on the uh on on tracking the the global electric uh the global electricity transition toward clean electricity um right. and yeah three years in to 35 people um um uh, spread across the world so wow. um, very exciting place to be at the moment oh wonderful and could you define uh clean en uh, clean electricity just uh, for anybody listening who might not be sure the difference between that <laughs> that's and a very good point i think everyone, ha everyone has their, <laughs> everyone has their own definition of clean electricity um for us it's um it's all of the renewable technologies that that, that cover not that just the new ones like wind and solar, the legacy ones like um, uh, hydro, um, 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 bioenergy, where it's actually genuinely sustainable, which is in, in many cases not the case. Um, and then clean electricity also then encompasses the kind of suite of, um, of not just uh, nuclear, but then the kind of other new uh, technologies that might be coming along, like uh, green hydro uh, electricity from green hydrogen. Um, <laughs> And yeah. CCS, where it's genuinely um, capturing carbon and operating as you, as it should do, or said as it says it's going to do on paper. Mm. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you, uh, so Ember is just looking at the electricity part. Um, so we can't expect uh, Ember to be looking at sort of uh, hydrogen for heating 
or um, what other kind of nonsense fuels are there? <laughs> <laughs> so many of them, aren't there? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, um, the, the bit that we, we're kind of focusing more on the electricity supply, but as the electricity transition picks up and electrification picks up, it'll be interesting to you know, be tracking more and more about the pickup in heat pumps, electric vehicles, everything else, and about how they're contributing towards that need for, for more clean electricity to make sure that there's you know, that pickup and clean electricity to go with um, those, those, um, those, those other things that are replacing energy in other parts of the sector outside the electricity sector. Okay. I want to get into like, I want to really break it down if that's all right with you. Um, could you define electricity? Because I think for so many people, we might understand that, um, there's an electric transition going on or uh, trying, people are trying to make that happen and electricity is better than fossil fuels, but electricity isn't a fuel. It's not the same as a fossil fuel, right? Um, it, so could you like, let's start at the very basics. What <laughs> is electricity and why is it important? Um, it's important because it's through so much of where we get our, our energy needs from, especially as, um, I, I, I guess, as, as households where um, um, that, that, that um, are powering so much of what we need. And I think that um, it, it's always been important. The reason why it's going to get more and more important is because of, as you go through the electricity transition, you'll need, like I said, you'll need um, other way. Electricity provides that way as that car like as a carrier. I think that's probably the word you're looking for as a carrier for energy to come through yeah. to uh, to to power your car, to power your your heating, um, 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 and and also power other parts of industry that uh, use coal or gas or oil directly at the moment, like steelworks and other things like that. So, um, so it's it's kind of always been a part of the energy system i think in the in the future it's going to be kind of the the majority of the energy system right okay and just to clarify for anybody that's listening and isn't sure what makes um electricity a clean form of energy is not the electricity in itself but where uh, how it's produced so if it's electricity produced by solar or by wind that is a form of renewable clean energy compared to uh, fossil fuels which emit carbon etc yeah and you've got coal which is at 35 mm. 36 percent of the world's electricity now is is, is still yeah. from coal generation so it's still in there but um especially you know across europe and the u.s gas generation is still a huge part of that mix as well um and has been uh, uh increasing in recent years so it's really um yeah it's not just coal within that mix but you've got that coal and gas that contribute to a huge amount of CO2 emissions, coal power alone um, emits 30% of all CO2 from, from total energy um, globally. So it's a huge part of that, the, the emissions problem. Right, okay. And maybe, again, this is something that um, perhaps doesn't get touched on enough because if there is such a focus on fossil fuels and um, what we're putting into our cars and how we're sort of running our mobility around the world. Um, the ele it matters where your electricity comes from. Um, and you were saying 36% of the world's electricity is still being generated by coal, which is a filthy, <laughs> filthy energy source, correct? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and that's why that's, right. that, that's what, that's the kind of the main problem that we were set up to, um, to kind of deal with as we go further through the electricity transition. There's more mm. more of a need to kind of more success story with that and then more of a need really to deal with the gas side as well. Right. Okay. So, could we talk about then um, the electricity that's been generated by coal? Where is that predominantly in the world? Um, is it on the up? Is it on? Uh, are we using less and less? Um, what What's the picture with? So, uh, twenty 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 two will likely let's let's get the bad news out of the way. Twenty twenty two is likely to set a new world record for the uh, of a record for the amount of uh, coal generation that the world has. Um, right. um, we we kind of it's kind of been plateauing around the same level for. Um, for, for not far off um, 10 years now, since 2012, there's not been too much change in, to, to all of that. So it's not been rapidly increasing like it was in the decade before. Um, but we're not quite at a point where we've, we've shifted it globally to be structurally falling. We're getting there close. Uh, we're getting there very slowly. Um, and certainly maybe this is the last year that, or maybe this is the 2022 is the year that coal peaks. We're certainly very close. I'd probably put my money on the 2022 as the year that coal peaks um half of it is in in china um so a huge mm -hmm. amount of their their coal is from china I'm, I'm sure that we'll get an opportunity to talk about china again but they're building clean electricity faster than anyone else so they are doing something about that problem which is really cool mm -hmm. 80 percent in total of the world's coal generation is in asia so 
is a is a bit that really uh, interests us in where we work. Um, so much of that kind of um, the the one of the I guess the for me the the biggest success of the the, the Paris Climate Agreement so far was actually kind of stopping some of the new build coal that's coming through. So where you look at new coal power plants that are being built now, there's still some coming online in China, but it's one fraction of what had been coming online. And across right. the whole of Asia, like where there was a, like a potential for a huge amounts of coal power plants that could mean that we're going to breach four degrees. So much of that um, through 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 good campaigning, um, um, but just, just generally through that momentum away from coal has now kind of received as a threat, which is quite good. So, um, so yeah, it's a bit of a, a kind of a good news, bad story within Europe. Um, it's it's down now um a 16 percent of the electricity mix uh, many countries have faced almost faced it out the uk's only at one to two percent of its annual um electricity coming from coal so uh, mm. so there's some good good stories there across the world um as well <laughs> and hopefully some good stories yet to come what was the leap in 2022 uh was that because of the war in ukraine um no not really it was just um uh uh, it wasn't a leap. It was um, it was a leap in 2021 as we rebounded back from COVID. Right. It was a it was a small rise. There was only a small rise where we we're just right. setting a new record. Broadly broadly speaking, when you take a step back at the long picture, like I say, we're about the we're not far off the levels back from back from 2012. Um, uh, so it's not it's not hasn't been structurally interest uh, increasing. We've been at that plateau, but we've been at that plateau for a long time now. And we're kind of like at the point now where it's like you know it's really going to start falling. <laughs> right. Okay. So how do we ensure that coal continues to start falling? Is part of the problem perhaps the link between coal-generated electricity and development if the vast majority of it is happening in Asia? Yeah, it's, it's a different picture on that across the world. If you look at um, um, uh, Africa, outside South Africa in itself, um, um, so much of the investment in, in electricity is, has, has not been into coal. So, so that, that coal risk hasn't been growing at all. Um, right. There's almost no new coal power plants that have come online in the last five years. In Africa, almost no new ones that are likely to in the next five years. Um, in South America, it's not far off that. There's, um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated in, in, in Colombia and Mexico um, and, and a few left in Brazil. But, um, but broadly speaking, they, they didn't get that about that. That, that pick up into coal they've been kind of relying on um historically on hydro uh, generation um uh which they obviously have good resources for um and then kind of picking a bit into gas as they go along so the story is a little bit on the development story is a little bit mixed depending on how people go into that <laughs> within asia they've very much been sold the coal story um it's the cheapest form of electricity um there's been a lot of uh investment there's been a, through the the kind of uh, coal companies there's been um so much um uh push of the technology coming out to build new coal power plants which is kind of how they kind of got bought into that a little bit in the first place and it is nice that that that, that we kind of got to the point where that that pressure is changing slightly um and when you look at um all countries across the world and we'll, i'm sure we'll talk, have a chance to talk about this more but um even where coal is rife i think that when wind and solar have really come into the mix now and people are getting that so so um, it's not. This isn't just a kind of European centric, UK centric thing. But mm -hmm. um, that that coal is dirty. It's not the way forward. I think that, that that everyone's kind of got that message now, and it's just a question of how quickly that that people can deal with it. All right. Okay. And how many plants would we need to be turning offline, <laughs> or taking offline every year in order to oh, make, perhaps the... not meet the Paris Accords, but. What, what's what's the, what's the Matt Gray number that he always quotes? Is it one one power plant uh, a, a day for the next ten years? I need to come back to you on that. It's something like that. It's something <laughs> it's something incredible like a power plant a day that you need to be right, closing. Okay. There's a lot of coal power plants out there. <laughs> right. Okay. Gosh. Um, and out of interest, if you have a nation that's really dependent on coal currently and wants to transition, um, would they have to sort of fuel their transition with coal and with other dirty fuels initially in order to to make it happen um i think that that's how it's always kind of been pitched to people and how it's been, and i think that as um as time's gone on that's obvious that that's not the case uh, yeah I, you probably remember the little wobble like several years ago where bill gates was like it's okay you can, it doesn't matter if africa goes on to coal and 
um, through the development cycle here because it's it's such a small amount of energy. It's not going to affect global, global emissions in quite that way. But I think as that technology is picked up and the quality of the 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 the, the, the cost of that technology has moved on, um, there's just no there's just no reason that that makes sense anymore. Um, or when you're building a coal power plant, um, you generally import in the coal. You've got a central. You have mm. to build a centralized system because it's such a big scale. And you compare that to, against, you know, how countries in Africa across Southeast Asia can roll out solar. Um, there, there's no comparison to the the speed and cost at which you can do that nowadays. Right. Okay. So the cost benefit analysis for renewables is just better than than the fuels that we've typically been relying on. Yeah, and that's been that's been a kind of recent thing. So that that that's kind of swung. It's been kind of slowly changing every year. Then it's kind of getting towards like 2018, 2019, where it's just like, okay, yeah, this is like, we're definitely at the point where um, um, uh, uh, fossil, uh, sorry, um, uh, wind and solar is cheaper than new fossil. Um, and now, because we're kind of go through in the energy crisis, and you have um, uh, such high gas and coal prices, then that's really changed the scales. So kind of going into, in before the energy crisis, that had already kind of almost changed. And now, mm. and now you've still got like um, it's not just that gas prices have risen for a uh, for a year. It's you can see the the, the fall curve looking out the same for coal. You're at these high. You're going to be at these high levels for 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 years to come. Right. Okay. So everything pushing us towards renewables, apart from perhaps some political will. Um, so let's talk about gas then before we get into the renewables. So electricity generated by gas. Which parts of the world are dependent on that? Um, what are the emissions from it, um, and how is it is it declining, <laughs> and if so, how um, much? Quite possibly, uh, it's been your record in 2022. Okay, like coal. Uh, quite quite okay, possibly, great. like coal, it might be the um, it might well be the, the 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 last or the highest ever year of of, of gas generation. Um, it's following um, um, a similar picture to coal, where you're you're now at a level where where the countries that have gas generation are building wind and solar. At, enough of a rate that hopefully that gas generation is going to come down. Um, um, the countries that um, have it so high, a lot of OEC, OECD countries, um, that's where most of the gas is, in the US, right. um, in Europe, um, huge gas power reliance. And um, and in both of the US and the, the EU, you've got coal generation that's it's just half the level of what it has been a decade ago. There's been huge falls. So how do you, uh, like, uh, the next stage of that is really to start addressing gas generation. And that's certainly where the EU is at the moment. And um, it's where the UK kind of heads mindset is at the moment as we're um, to try to trying to push towards 100% clean or towards um, in the direction of near 100% clean power. So it's kind of quite an exciting part of that journey now where it really started with coal and now that political emphasis has really shifted towards gas. Um, on the emission side, kind of part of the reason that the urgency has come around is just just how clear the 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 leaks are from some gas fields in some ways and um and certainly in europe where so much of the gas comes comes via russia um, um like a lot of the gas that, that, that we get into into europe necessarily in the uk from from russia um but there's there is large um, leakage associated with that so when we're looking from a domestic perspective you're like oh it's half the levels of coal it's like no, it's not it's, it's more than that okay so it's it is it's half the emissions of coal when it's when it's burnt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Burnt. And then depending, okay. depending on where it comes from, you get extra on that. You also, by the way, one of our areas of, of expertise within Ember is actually on coal mine methane. By the way, uh, coal mines leak methane as well, as well as gas and oil mm. fields. Uh, um, <laughs> so you can multiply that up as well. But um, but gas generation in itself, yeah, um, depending on where it comes from, it can, it, like at the worst case, um, it can be as bad as coal in most cases. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's substantially better than coal by... Um, um, maybe maybe half the emissions, just so just under half the emissions by the time you add the methane back in. Yeah, I suppose using um, a word like better though <laughs> with any kind of fossil fuel at this stage is almost uh, well, we just sim we simply mustn't it must. But what tell me what gas it is? I actually just listening to you talk there, I realised I don't even know what gas natural gas is. Is it methane? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's very confusing sometimes. Right. <laughs> right, okay. There's so many different uh, terms for it: uh, methane, natural gas, fossil gas. Um, it's all the same thing, uh, CH4, um, and um, uh, released unburnt into the atmosphere. Um, it's um, um, in the short term, it's like 80 times as bad as CO2 is per ton. So um, it's really kind of potent in itself when it's not burnt, when it's just leaked. And 
and kind of the inherent problem of, of just all of us being reliant on so much on gas is it's very easy to leak out without anyone noticing you know you have gas leaks as you walk yeah, down yeah, the street yeah. you can smell gas it it happens occasionally yeah. and, the, um, and it doesn't take much of that to tip the scales and add more onto the the the, the warming impact of of um of natural gas of fossil gas Definitely. I mean, so yes, methane is 80 times as potent as CO2. It only hangs about for 20 years in comparison to carbon dioxide, 100 years. But it is absolutely mad that we're burning a greenhouse gas at the same time as we're having annual conferences about the dangers of greenhouse gas. How much is leaked out of interest every year in a country like the UK? Um, for the, the, like the, the rough number on um, the, the best practice that the, the gas companies and oil companies are trying to get to is I'm oh, sorry gas companies is to be leaking at a point point two percent so that's like the ideal level to get to and I forget what that adds on to emissions point that's two kind percent of, of what a point two percent of the gas that they produce so on if you're right. producing gas only point two percent of that um, but in many cases it's um uh it's it's a percent or two percent and I think three percent is the level that it breaks even with coal so if you leak more than three percent uh... of natural gas then then burning gas comes as, as as dirty as if you were burning coal. Wow, that is wild. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah, you you find a gas leak, deal with it. It's, um, <laughs> it's uh, uh, and 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 it's really nice uh, in that there's actually a new focus on methane that hasn't existed before. So you might have seen the global methane pledge, like, um, and there was the kind of started with the IPCC report that came out in twenty early twenty twenty one, I think it was. Mm-hmm. um that that basically said if we're not dealing with methane then we can't hit one and a half degrees we've got to have a big focus on methane and that that happened at the at the, at the start of 2021 by the then by the end of 2021 we ended up with the with the global methane pledge where countries for the first time are actually taking this seriously and looking at it where before like there wasn't any focus on it at all um mm. the amount of heating we've, because all that heating is front loaded um we've already mm-hmm. had um uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of the degrees they're warming now. So much of the warming 1.1. has so much of that 1.1 degrees has come from uh, from methane already because that 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 mm. that warming is um, is front loaded uh, as it gets released. Mm. Yeah, I think the danger of um, the emission cycle essentially, and what is quite difficult to to grasp, is that every day we're putting more and more into the atmosphere that will never be taken out. But every day that we emit, we are pushing well. I've had people on the show scientists say like 1.5 is dead. Like we're already, it's already baked in. We're all already going to well overshoot it. We need to be talking about 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 and not make the next sort of limit uh, two, for example, because then that will just become sort of the natural psychological um, limit that people will aim for. Oh, let's limit to under two rather than trying to stay as close to 1.5. Let's go into the renewables then. And uh, after sort of, (laughs) <laughs> whisking through them i'd like to talk about policy that's happening and then jivon's paradox as well um, and the what paradox jivon's paradox jivon's paradox jevon's paradox okay you might have to explain that to me um <laughs> oh yeah sure absolutely should we do that now then let's do it now all right okay so jevon's paradox is um oh god <laughs> jevon's paradox is the more efficient you make a thing the more energy you use anyway overall. Um, and so some physicists say this is why even though we're um, making more and more renewables and even though the um, renewables are growing every year, we're actually um, producing, consuming more and more energy every year. So they say any focus on a purely sort of clean, green, renewable future kind of misses the point about the fact that like the more energy we have available to us typically as a society just the more that we consume and so we need to like bake degrowth into all of these conversations yeah um so um how fast is it growing was that the first question no policy Uh, we're at um so so um when you look across the world now and wind and solar on promise and and kind of climate promises um weirdly in most countries um the political ambition has kind of almost got to a level where that's not the constraint um so that has been the constraint hugely <laughs> up to up to kind of last year and you're kind of getting to the point now where most countries have got 
policies of, of, of wind and solar in place and want to be able to build them, they're kind of baked in. And of course, they're not ambitious enough. Of course, they need to go faster. So there's still a question around ambition. I think I'm not pretending there's not. But in so many countries now, it's about the implementation of that. It's trying to make it happen at enough speed. Um, so mm. like, and it is it, 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 happening in so many different countries everywhere. Take India as an example. India had a target um, um, for last December to build 170 gig, 175 gigawatts um, of wind and solar that they've had for a few years and in a running and tried to sorry, achieve. Sorry, Dave, what does 175 gigawatts mean? Um, it, it, well, it, it's getting to, uh, India to almost a tenth of their electricity from wind and solar. Right. That will be that, that's that, that's the kind of aim, which is which is in line, almost in line with the global average, which for India as a developing country is 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 mm -hmm. is, is, is amazing to have that, and it's amazing that they're they're they they are they are progressing on that um, in the way they are. Oh. But in terms of like the implementation rollouts, they're 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 behind on it. Um, if you look at wind across Europe, um, there's real issues in terms of um, some of the, the barriers on that. As you go through the electricity trans transition, it gets faster and faster and faster. There's going to be so many more kind of side effects that come in from different places that could potentially slow that transition down. It's a huge transition that is going to affect like so what? many people in different ways. So, um, so the most obvious one is through planning. That's the one that's impacting wind and solar across the world um, everywhere mm. at the moment. It's a very slow thing to get planning processes mm -hmm. the governments are kind of realizing this they're going through like ways to accelerate planning processes to to be able to get these uh the, the projects approved and built out it's a huge bits of infrastructure we're talking about um the that do the 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 um they're kind of falling foul to, to some of the some of the, the the rules that are in there and that and the government's looking like, need to almost kind of get their hands dirty with so many more of these boring things another one is kind of grid connection so you want to build a, mm. a, a solar farm a solar farm great you've got a bit of desert land how do you connect it to the grid um how does the the system operator go yeah okay let's um here's the connection that enables you to do that um and then there's the kind of um the broad um the uh, the kind of electricity balancing side so how do you make sure that you you're planning around that much wind and solar in the grid that you can balance in between uh, all the hours um, to store enough electricity and match demand and supply in every minute, because we talked about what electricity is, it's a, it's, a, um, it's it's just not quite as flexible as um, as to be able mm -hmm. to stock coal or stock uh, oil or stock gas in quite the same way. You need to be balancing minute by minute. Um, and then the, the final bit, which I guess um, concerns me most, is kind of that long term in, uh, aspect. So as you're building out more solar panels, more wind. Um, as more kind of jobs go through the transition of losing fossil jobs and other bits, this comes more, um, it comes more visible to, to everyone within a, within a country, within a community, within a town. And how do you make sure there's not a big backlash on that? You're going to be making right. sure that when people are building, you know, uh, solar panels, they're doing it in a, in a way that isn't doing it on agricultural land and, 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 and looks really daft. You've got to do it in a way that doesn't encourage a, huge mining boom boom in in lithium which is causing huge amounts of uh, mm. un, un, undesired consequences there's it's such a huge transition it's really it's picking up speed in such a way we're going to really start hitting some of these things quickly and you've almost got to like just be aware mm. of them and make sure that there's enough momentum to keep yourself carrying through mm. so what are some of the things that we could do to overcome and to navigate those potential consequences because Certainly with the mining, I mean, we're seeing child labor happening in uh, places like, I think, was it DRC or the, the Congo where, for yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, 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 for cobalt, yeah, um, which is a precious mineral that's need, uh, needed for batteries. Um, and certainly the unions are very, very afraid of the potential fallout of people losing their jobs in the fossil fuel economy and without something like a green job guarantee or without that sort of dialogue with the green movement um, or the potential of a green job guarantee, we're sort of perhaps lacking some teeth that could really help this this transition. So how do we ensure that this positively affects people around the world um, whilst going at the speed that it needs to in order to limit heating as much as possible? Yeah, it's it's tricky. I mean, it's kind of like one of those all hands on deck scenarios. There's like there's never kind of a magic bullet. Everyone's got to kind of be aware yeah. of it. And if you know the first the first step in it, all really for me is kind of know that that's the direction of travel. If you know that's the direction of travel, 
then you end up in a very different mindset. When I first started working on Cold Phase out in 2012, like the the whole concept of um, of that you would need to phase out coal in the first place, you were arguing against that. Like, that was the problem. The problem was is that if you're you know part of a coal community, you have coal mining there. It's like why you no know, we that we'll always need coal in some way like and you might get into a conversation about how much you need to reduce it but not like a whole con- a conversation of phase out and right. like and that whole like over the last decade my god like there's been such a change in that not just in in across the whole of the world um which is which is kind of the first place to start that that you can have those open conversations and um for us well like uh, in the work that we do at ember one of the 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 kind of strands of our impact is trying to shape the narrative to try to kind of try and pull out some of the, the 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 positive stories try to step up with some of the kind of myth busting where other people were um uh, um uh, throwing um um throw, throwing kind of lies around on all of this because that, that that's kind of how people are impacted underneath all of that we we we, we know that you can see how politicians respond to different pressures coming through on this and unfortunately you kind of like um that that narrative is a lot more important than than it should be and that's why it's important like things like if there's a solar farm that doesn't make sense that's gonna destroy a whole of agricultural land it's like yes we probably should look at that again we probably should open that up so that we don't disengage you know a whole load of a uh, whole load of um uh, of people around that so just trying to careful ask the right questions and uh um and, and kind of getting everyone pulling in the right direction i think right okay it's a very um hopeful and optimistic uh, <laughs> vision um i'm curious as to whether or not ember has looked at sort of uh, energy energy consumption versus energy needs um i have a former guest simon misha um and he says that we are currently uh, a 19 terawatt society so for everyone listening, that means we use 19 terawatts an hour, which is globally, which is a huge amount of energy. And he says to um, have a sustainable world where everybody's energy demands are met and when and we're one in which we are in line with the materials available to us to make renewable energy because we do need precious metals. Um, and right now we haven't quite figured out like the recycling of batteries, for example, um, or, you know, turbines, all these things, they need a huge amount of cement. So like, the fact that renewables are actually rebuildables, um, he says that we need to drop from a 19 terawatt society to a five terawatt society globally um, if we're going to sort of survive the, the transition as a society. I was wondering if Ember sort of looked into any of that. The... No, we, we, we haven't been doing anything quite that long term on, on things. Right. Um, um, the, the interesting thing on the, the and, and one of the, the compelling arguments for electrification, um, for clean power electrification is the, is the, the, the efficiency savings you get through that. So as your, as your, um, like a coal power plant is only one converting one third of that energy into, into electricity. So if you're talking 17 down to five, well, actually, if you're using wind and solar in the first place, which doesn't have that inherent loss built into it, um, then automatically oh, that deals with a little bit. The second bit is as you're going through. Um, Sorry, the, Dave, can I pause you there? Could you just talk a little bit more about that and explain that 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 energy loss and why it doesn't happen with wind and solar for people? To um, um, it kind of depends on how, how you measure efficiency. But if you've got um, when you um, when a, a solar power is generating that 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 one kilowatt hour, whatever the the measure of unit is. Then that's going directly into the grid. There's no extra losses from all of that. There's there's an efficiency aspect of how much of the sun hitting the solar panel can be converted, and that's going up every year because the solar panels are getting every better every year. So I think like the average now is like um, 20% conversion rate or something like that, and that kind of magnitude when you're buying it. Um, so, um, but there's kind of a limit to how high that can naturally be be captured anyway. But um, so but that's not kind of quite efficiency in the same way, the same with the wind turbine spinning around, how much of that wind you capture, well, does it matter quite how much of you capture? It's not the same concept of with a, a coal power plant that you're actually physically losing two thirds of that energy that's going up, um, going up a chimney in the form of heat. Right. Okay. So that's what that is. When you burn coal, you are losing, um, yeah. two thirds, uh, to, in, to heat to the sky, which is part of the global warming problem as well, I imagine. 
Um, yeah, a, a, a very small, insignificant part. But, uh, right. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, then, like and, then, and, and then, and then, and then, and on the electrification side, there's there's big mm. efficiencies coming in. So at the moment, again, uh, an electric car is thirty um, percent efficient. I think. Um, sorry, a, a, a fossil, uh, an, an ice car, a, um, 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 a, a, a petrol car is about thirty percent efficient. So then an electric car is well over 90% efficient. So you get like a step change in efficiency. A gas, um, using gas, a heat pump, sorry, um, instead of gas for space heating, um, a heat pump is actually really bizarre when you look at the efficiency. It's because if you've got, I've got my little um, uh, fan heater keeping me warm down here and um, uh, it's quite efficient. Like it's, it's, it's over 90% efficient. So um, it spews out heat quite well, but a heat pump actually, does a lot better than that. A heat pump acts like a fridge where it takes the hot air and separates it from the cold air. So you actually end up with three times as much energy as what you put in. So it's kind of the opposite of uh, efficiency. So if you measure it like that, you end up with uh, uh, you end up with um, with with, with yeah, actually kind of creating energy from 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 that perspective. Um, so it's like three hundred percent efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, and then, and then, obviously, you've got um, you've got other, like other things getting more efficient all the time with uh, LED lighting and everything else. So, so naturally, there's a kind of efficiency curve that comes down. That we're we're we're, we're doing better every year on that, and electrification and and replacing um, uh, fossil generation with um, with with new clean generation will make a big part of that seventeen down to five. Um, I think that. Um, as we go through time, I think that we'll find a lot of ways that actually I haven't read through these calculations of why you need to get from 17 to 5. But being a bit of an optimist, I, I, I do think we'll go through that and find ways to kind of come out the other side of that. Um, if you look at like one of the best ways to, to be able to demonstrate that is to, is to look at the, how the reserves of lithium have increased so dramatically in the last few years. It's not that it's been geologically like um, just created. It's like we didn't know to look for it before. Um, we didn't like there wasn't that much value in like in lithium to go out and hunt for it. And now there's suddenly a lot more value in it. We know we're going to need a lot more of it. And then all of a sudden, like the lithium, the reported lithium reserves are going through the roof. We just uh, find a way to adapt with that. Also, like um, um, like the if you look at how much silicon there is required for a solar panel. Um, uh, it gets less every year because there's just better ways to make it. An example, cobalt. I think I'm right in saying that the new Tesla battery that um, that's being developed doesn't use cobalt at all, um, and then that's been actually taken out of the the need to be able to put in the, uh, the, the the battery in the first place. So there's all sorts of ways that are going through this that will make that that transition a lot better than than than, than it may look today. So. A couple of points on that. Um, so Simon's research, which is about the fact that we are at a, it's a nine, 19 terawatt society and we need to go down to five. That is using um, last year's figures for the uh, materials reserves that we have. Um, so we don't have, according to his research, of all the um, materials that we need for renewable energy, we don't have enough uh, materials in the world to produce even one generation right now. And obviously for renewables, you need to be able to uh, rebuild your solar uh, farms every 20 years and update your wind turbines every 10 years. And so he's saying like this whole idea that we will just electrify the world simply cannot happen if our energy demands are this high. So we need to reduce our energy demands by um, from 19 to, to 5 in order to be able to continue producing energy for more than one generation. Um, and then also that thing about efficiencies is Jivon's paradox again. So everything is getting uh, more efficient, but physic this physicist, and it's been sort of proven time and time again, says, well, the more efficient that we make things, the more energy that we consume because more is available to us. So listen, it's, it's perhaps not a very fair question because it's not perhaps what Ember does, but bearing in mind these kinds of constraints, how do we ensure that we're also contracting our energy demands so that we can electrify the world according to our material reserves? So that we can do it for future generations and so also then that we can do it equitably and fairly um, because obviously there are nations like the United States that are using 15 times per capita the amount of energy that they should be according to the UN and then you've got developing nations on the continent of Africa that are using a fraction per capita so it's also about balancing that out to ensure that the energy transition is just.
I, I, I guess as I'm just kind of I um, probably branding myself as a bit of an optimist already through this uh, through through this interview, and probably a bit, bit chirpier than uh, or a bit more cheerful and hopeful than um, the, 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 than others that um, have come before me. I I, I do think that um, when we um, the, the, I'm really excited about the idea of clean electricity coming uh, coming through, and I think that. What we've got to be careful, like, like, and I see one of my roles as being quite careful with that, is it doesn't mean that there's suddenly an un unlimited supply of electricity coming through. And I think that's the, right. that's a really kind of, I think, don't, don't think that will ever be the case. Like this whole idea that you're going to end up with like unlimitedly cheap electricity um, with no consequences. Uh, like that's a really kind of bad narrative to, to, to be going with. Like I am an optimist. We want clean electricity and get to, towards that but there is always a cost for that in all sorts of ways um um, um at all sorts of levels so you've always got to have people to have a have an eye on efficiency and to go through and it's, it's really interesting i think in the in uh, i don't know why i see always see the examples in the u.s but um rather than anywhere else but um <laughs> um in in the case of like when you get solar panels on your roof like there seems to be something in the u.s like that's in their psychology that they've kind of got free electricity coming or cheap or their own electricity mm -hmm. coming through they can use and therefore I do understand that there there is some kind of feedback with that and then in in Europe you, for some reason I don't really know you don't quite see that same philosophy two-thirds of solar panels in Europe are put on rooftops you do have that like there is a, a a kind of a feedback but maybe people just see it as more of a community thing where it's feeding into the grid and it's helping other people kind of give their energy I'm not quite sure what it is but there's definitely mm -hmm. something in that feedback that um, that as people, you know, um, are turning on their heating as power in their cars, you can see you can see that link kind of working in their head of like, oh, I've got I've got I've got loads of clean electricity here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so would you say then that in policy circles right now, or the the work that Ember is doing, there isn't this talk of like contracting or um, perhaps like thinking of a a fair redistribution of energy right now to ensure that. Um, as I said, the countries like the USA cannot consume 15 times per capita what they should be, according to the UN, whilst other nations, people are consuming a fraction of it and living in sort of, well, desperate fuel you, 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 To make impact, you've got to go with, um, with, with, with areas that you think you might be able to influence change on. <laughs> it's, always a, it's always hard, like, as as non-profits or like when you're kind of talking about this of like do i ask for this, for this thing that there's almost certainly going to go through or do i ask for this thing where there's only like a 10 percent chance that it's going to go through mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and it's quite hard to to get that balance right but but so within so many of the governments in the world it it never seems that right kind of narrative like it doesn't seem to be a strong enough um world that that there is needs to be that form of degrowth coming through to actually restrict things back, and there is ways that you can deal with that um, um, without actually addressing the like the degrowth head on. So it's to mm. bring in like how important can energy efficiency be to make sure it's maximised and um, and things around that is to make sure the clean energy in the first place is rolled out as quickly and uh, and and um, uh, with low impact as possible. Um, so they're they're the ways of kind of campaigning that we'll we'll always go with as a group, and I understand why 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 others want to push that that degrowth through. Like for us, it, like trying to highlight the inconsistencies between countries is is really important. Um, mm -hmm. um, so those ones with higher coal burn, um, it's been um, uh, um, last year in in Australia trying to pick on them because they have the highest coal burn of per capita of. Um, of any country is like kind of quite a powerful narrative right. that kind of really um 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 really traveled really traveled well there that the 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 um that there's kind of really really important to, to 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 understand right okay understood so then tell me let's let's go back into some good news um based on sort of the the rate of growth uh how much sort of renewable uptake can we see um and are we seeing it begin to replace uh, fossil fuels as well? And you know, uh, yeah, well? uh, yes, almost everywhere. So, um, uh, so um, we're globally we're at that level where the amount of um, uh, wind and solar that was is being added is is almost meeting global increase in electricity demand. So, a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of hydro in there. 
So you're you're basically at the level where clean electricity is matching electricity demand growth, um, which is why we're okay. kind of at peaking emissions for the power sector now. So that's the kind of total growth. And then obviously you look within the UK and um, coal generation has gone from like 40% down to one or 2% in, 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 in not much more than a decade. Um, and so many other countries have had that a very successful story on coal that's now feeding towards uh, gas. And you are like, now we're starting to pick out examples of countries with falling gas generation where um, that has been caused by, by the, the rollout of wind and solar. So um, Netherlands has been seen a few years of that. Um, Ireland, the UK is into that now. Australia, um, the there's is, is having falling both coal and gas generation. So as the, uh, you're, you're definitely at that stage of, of of the transition now, where you can see some 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 really big falls in, in an awful lot of countries. So globally, we're a tenth of the uh, world's electricity from wind and solar. Um, the IEA say by for for one and a half degrees. We need to be at 40% of the world's electricity from wind and solar by 2030. So seven years from now, it's like, um, it be tricky. <laughs> um, we, so we need to be half? 40% uh, of the world's electricity 40%. from 10% today. Right. So uh, you look at some of the growth curves out there at the moment, and, and the mm. growth curves are, are huge, especially for solar. There's some really exciting um, um, stuff going in solar at the moment where that capacity manufacturing is the the capacity sorry, the the manufacturing capacity is really really picking up um mm. and um uh and therefore there is uh, so many solar panels out there that can be deployed very quickly right okay and tell me do you know the rate of ooh, how do i ask this question i know i want to ask but i don't know how to formulate it um so we have our electricity demands and we have, you know, some things that have always been electric or, you know, always <laughs> pushing that word always, but always been electric. But now we also have this, like, what what is the, the rate of transition, not just increased energy demands, um, but also the rate of transition from people having, well, I don't know, you know, uh, diesel and petrol vehicles to um, electric you, You're vehicles. talking about S-curves, so you're talking about the gross rates coming up. The acceleration is that what you're talking about i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what am i talking about um do, can, do, can we define what is sort of like what was always existing electricity demands versus the increased rate because of the transition oh right sorry um beg your pardon uh, um no well you can't um it's very hard right. so um well, so we want to do more work on that. Um, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance um, have kind of been leading with some of that. There's a little bit from the IEA on that. Um, broadly speaking, um, when you look at how much of the like uh, like the penetration of wind, uh, sorry, of uh, heat pumps and electric vehicles and and electrolyzers, which will also be a like a a mainstay of the electricity demand, um, their rollout so far has been very slim. So um, the the growth rate on the ground is immense you know it's going to be a story throughout the 2020s in terms of actual like impacting electricity demand at the moment um it's not a it's not leading to a substantial pickup and one of the jobs that we want to be looking at um is to try to kind of separate that that growth out and it's very very hard to do because you, you've mm. never got the hypothetical of um well would that have been used on gas and oil before would that be on, used on electricity and is that new demand or would that have been there anyway um so mm. it's possible to it is possible to bring that back and so far that that amount is is small but throughout this decade it's gonna it's gonna change quite rapidly and when you look globally by the by 2040 you, you're gonna the um, everyone's forecasting you know twice the electricity global electricity demand what you have today so that you, we know there's going to be that massive pickup in electricity demand um so how <laughs> so so, so you're at a point now where, where we need to kind of always get beyond just to thinking about coal and gas power and to be thinking about like the extra electrification of all the other sectors coming on, because that's going to hit us really, really hard in the, in the next few, it's not hitting us at the moment. It's going to hit us very, very hard in the future. Um, and, and really, I've just been doing a whole load of analysis on the, on Europe's electricity transition. The moment the electricity demand's falling, and we had some really big falls from October where, where mm -hmm. everyone was. It, mostly from the affordability crisis, cost of living crisis, bills right, have gone okay. up. Um, so people are really holding back on 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 using electricity and gas for themselves. Um, 
uh, so a bit of en uh, electricity efficiency, uh, sorry, energy efficiency in there as well, but also um, just because prices have gone up so much, um, some really like heavy um, energy and intensive businesses have have cut back production a little bit as well. So you're <laughs> seeing some big falls. You're like, mm. you know, you're seeing it fall at the moment, but you know that you're going to get this the, the, this big this big increase coming in the next few years. And trying to keep an eye on that, trying to make sure that you. You, you're you're putting that into your calculations of like right we are going to have to build an awful lot of clean electricity for all of this right fingers crossed we do then i guess <laughs> um how many so you're saying that 10 uh, percent of the world's electricity is currently being produced by renewables we want to get to 40 percent by 2030 is the current rate of growth of that going to meet that target um Depends what metric you're taking and exactly how you make it. Um, probably not. Mm. Um, solar, yes. Right. Solar's doing amazingly. Um, solar's got a real acceleration path on that. The biggest problem with solar is um, the the concentration of the whole of the, the supply chain and the manufacturing process within China. So right. it'll be interesting to see how countries respond to that. And um, um, and that's the, the biggest risk for the solar industry. But China has so much manufacturing capacity that came on last year that's coming on again this year. Um, it's just insane. Um, winds has got its own challenges and winds, winds growth is, is good, but it's not what it needs to be. And a lot of that is held back by planning. Um, mm -hmm. and it's trying to get around some of those planning aspects. Um, and obviously, you know, the situation in the UK with onshore winds, um, um, that exists in so many countries, um, but so many countries also don't have that really good offshore wind, um, set up that the UK has got that allows, um, a land and access to the, to the grid in the way the UK does. Right. Okay. Um, and then finally, the last one uh, that we should talk about is biomass. Um, oh. Now, I'm going to use hard language here because it's uh, the Planet Critical podcast, but biomass is a bit of a scam. Uh, <laughs> releases more carbon emissions than coal even. Um, and yet the UK does not account for it in its uh, gross emissions. Um, where are we with that? Is that gradually being taken offline with the recent Drax scandal where they were found the sort of biggest biomass producer in the UK was found to be importing sort of ancient woodland from Canada in order to feed its furnaces or is that growing as well? Um, so um, within, within the UK, within Europe, it's kind of hit a bit of a plateau. Like the, re like the UK went big in but more than any other country mm. in the whole of the world. So what happened with Drax was um, a little bit unique on the scale it was the um of anywhere else and the reason was was like the uk at the time was like um oh when the so solar sound a bit complicated a bit expensive and at the time they they, they were yeah. but you look back towards kind of you know you're looking back at 2010 2008 2010 2012 i think the contracts were signed and um um and, and it was the cheapest way to get renewable electricity so i had that appeal I have that appeal anywhere now there's nowhere else that that you the, the the bioenergy is as cheap as wind and solar so a lot of it just has gone right. naturally gone away from economics through um a lot of it has gone away because people have realized that yeah this isn't not delivering in the way that people have said it would um and uh, a lot of the campaigning is so useful in that to try to bring that to, to politicians to understand like you're looking on paper you're, you're saying this is clean electricity but it's really not um and for for us, like most of like we're doing a bit of campaign work in in Europe on it. Um, we had been doing more in the past on it. Um, broadly speaking, like uh, so like the the problem is a little bit like especially relating to the electricity sector. It's, it, it's not that bad within Europe, and at the moment, it's really just making sure that there's not a pickup, especially in Asia at the moment, where some countries right, okay. are talking about that. So. Um, yeah, it's a it's an issue. I try not to get too emotive about it. Six percent of mm. the world's electricity is not growing that quickly. Um, so um, for me, the biggest thing around bioenergy is where the IEA and others are like saying, yes, it's got it's got to grow massively. Actually, you know, it's not going to grow massively <laughs> because it has mm. so many problems. Like they're they're probably not going to be mm. overcome. How do you make sure that you replace the clean energy from somewhere else to make sure that? They're not stifling the, the rollout of clean energy because um, within Europe, when we talk about renewables targets, so much of it last decade, there was an awful lot that was met, met with bioenergy last decade. That if that didn't exist, like wind and solar would have to shoulder so much more. So it's trying to get the sums of right in all of that, that you're like, okay, we, we, we've we got to, if that's not going to exist, we need to make sure that we do fill the hole and fill it in a better way than we would with bioenergy. Right. Okay. Well, 
lots, uh, <laughs> lots to learn, lots going on. Fingers crossed. Um, certainly, I would like to see much more conversation around like energy demands and energy uh, contraction in this space. Although um, I do understand that there is there's a lot of different things that need to happen and everybody pushing on the pressure point that they can in the most effective way is sort of the best thing to do right now. The network of people taking different actions. Um, so here's hoping we transition and whilst we're transitioning, contract slightly. <laughs> uh, Dave, thank you so much for all of this information. My final question for you is who would you like to platform? Um, is it cheating to put two names down? Um, uh, I uh, my, my first one to carry on tells a bit of a similar story to me, probably a lot more convincingly, um, is King Phil Bond from the Rocky Mountain Institute. He used to work for Carbon Tracker. Um, he um, is a bit of an optimist like, my, like myself. He understands these S-curves of clean energy taking off and, um, and trying to put all of that in, in context. Um, and the second one is, um, uh, you, you may have come across, uh, it's Hannah Ritchie from Our World in Data um, at University of Oxford. Um, and um, she, I, I really, um, uh, really respect her and like her for the way that she comes across with her, the pragmatism that, that she speaks around environmentalism. I think that people get very um, emotional and, 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 um, and um, down and almost like in some cases depressed around kind of the state of the world and what's happening. And and our world in data does um, such a fantastic job to try to not just bring out the good news stories, but trying to tell an honest picture. But I think that, that it's very easy to kind of um, get yourself, you know, for example, around bioenergy, get yourself like in a bit of a, um, like a thing around the injustice of it all when it's kind of a, a small part of the bigger picture. And when you take a step back at the bigger picture, um, just, just as a, like in the world, like we're, we're not doing a bad job. Uh, we're not doing a great job, but we're, we're not doing a bad job, and we should celebrate that. Mm, okay, interesting. I I think uh, I, I think I disagree. <laughs> I think for me, <laughs> when you take a step back, it's taking a step back that allows you to see the injustice of it all, and that that needs to become a bigger part of the conversation because the actions of companies and nations and sort of these OECD countries and these you know are terrible energy consumption sort of a, which drives the exploitation of other nations. I uh, I don't believe if that was talked about more that suddenly people would you know necessarily like wake up to it and want to change it, but that has to be front and center of these conversations in order to ensure we just don't repeat the same exploitation going forward. I would think. Yeah, yeah, no, I I I I I I, I do agree an awful lot with that, and um, um, and um, and there's different ways for <laughs> there's different ways to approach that and to think about that, and um, hmm. um and um and it can be done with a with a glass half full of, of approach and i i kind of do admire people for to try and take that i think that um just a kind of final um thing from from my side from our sure. work within a, a a non-profit um what we've what we've on the electricity side because we work with with organizations across the world on 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 the transition and i think that they've had a real problem over the last year where They've had this realization that the whole campaigning has been on the fossil side and it's very easy to campaign on the fossil here's something that's bad um mm. and now you're in a world where actually the campaigning needs to be on the clean side um mm. because it needs to go faster so like whatever you say on the fossil side doesn't actually make any difference it's like what you need to say on the clean side and if you're like an organization like um working on for example climate investing like like yeah you, you look at it from an investor perspective and you've got to have almost a different mindset coming through. You look at it from a coal perspective that you look to take through to a clean perspective on, you know, electricity analysis like we're doing. You've got to come at it from a different perspective. And there's a lot of organisations through the last twelve months that have been going through that. And it's a it, it, it's a, been a really interesting thing for us to watch from a distance. We went through it a couple of years earlier where we were kind of focusing on coal generation. Uh, we made that switch across to clean, and now I think everyone's realising that to create that impact, that's that 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 there's got to be more people in that space not everyone in that space because like you said there's a whole community of people that have got to be working on all sorts of bits um on, on the transition um but there's got to be there's definitely got to be more ngos that are trying to um trying to carry that case for clean and why it's not happening faster forward rather than just taking that kind of that that more obvious um historic approach of focusing on fossil 
Right. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things to be said about wind and, and solar, you know, just how cheap it is, <laughs> how good it is, how cheap it is. These are the kinds of messages that also need to be platformed. Yeah, I completely agree. Dave, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's been a great discussion. If you want to learn more about Ember's work, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also read my weekly essays inspired by each podcast interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below. As always, thank you to the Planet Critical community who support the show and make all of this work possible. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.